Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the experiment number five, the determination of the percent acid in an unknown. This is a titration experiment, which maybe you did in high school, maybe you didn't. Um, either way, I'm going to go from the beginning all the way through the procedure and explain the methods that you're going to be using. All right, so the first part is making your oxalic acid solution. This is a little tricky. So oxalic acid is our standard for this experiment, which means we need to maintain it in, a, in an environment where it's not going to absorb water or dust or anything kind of weird. We don't want any contamination. So we have this device, which is called a desiccator. Okay, so a desiccator has vacuum grease around the outside edge to uh, seal out most of the atmosphere. So that way, what's in here um, is relatively stable and we have a desiccant down here in the bottom, okay? So this stuff changes color as it absorbs water. And we just heat it up to dry it out again and put it back in. Um, that absorbs water from the air that's inside of here. So it prevents excess water from building up. Now, um, in your pre-lab, you should have calculated how much oxalic acid dihydrate to add. So when you figure out the amount of oxalic acid dihydrate to weigh out, you need to include the weight of the water. Don't forget that, it's part of the crystal structure, okay? The, the dot does not mean multiply, it means that every piece of oxalic acid has two water stuck to it. So the total formula weight is gonna be all of these added together, okay? So we wanna make sure that it stays dihydrate and doesn't absorb any other water. So in order to do that, we store it in a desiccator. Um, I'm going to put gloves on because we remember from the safety video that acids are not super good for your skin. Remember when he put the egg in a beaker and then added sulfuric acid and it looks like a, a fried egg? Well, my skin is really similar chemically to eggs, so I don't want fried skin. It's gross. All right, so gloves, goggles, lab coat for the, or lab apron for the whole experiment because you are working with acids and bases the entire day. All right, so to get the lid off of the desiccator, and you're probably gonna do this in the instrument room where we have our scales. I'll touch on that in just a minute, our balances that measure correctly there. To get the lid off a desiccator, you can't just pull on it, all right? Um, but that doesn't work. You have to slide it. And it takes a little bit of elbow grease, all right? So you slide it off, and you're gonna take out your solid material, like so, and then you slide it back on to close it up. Don't leave the lid off, even if you're just weighing it out. You don't want to leave this stuff sitting out for any length of time because it'll mess it up for everyone else after you, all right? You'll notice that these are in small containers. They're not in the giant jar that we get from the manufacturer. That's because we don't want you to stick your spatulas in our stock jars. It's okay to put your spatula in these ones for the purposes of measuring out how much you need. Before you do this, make sure you check with your teacher um, to, to make sure you have the right amount. So the next thing is, is which scales do we use? So in the procedure, it says to measure to the nearest 0 0.1 milligram. We've seen this before. When something says two, that's a measurement of precision. It is not telling you to measure it in grams, okay? So, what we want to do is realize that when something says the precision is 0.1 milligrams, it means to four decimal places in grams. All of your masses are recorded in grams in lab. All you're doing is making sure that you choose the, the balance that has four decimal places, not the one that has two decimal places. So that's going to be our analytical balances that are in the instrument rooms, not the top loaders that are in the lab. Okay, so make sure you pay attention to that. Write down all four decimal places, okay? You wanna make sure that your mass is as accurate as you can make it, as precise as you can make it, because it is your standard. So everything that comes after this is gonna be based on that mass, all right? So then the next thing you're gonna do is take your flask into the balance room, slide the lid off, take out your oxalic acid, and weigh it out with the tear, tear container on the balance. Um, again, checking with your teacher before you do this to make sure you have the right amounts to add. Um, then you're going to just put in a little bit of distilled water uh, so that you can dissolve this, which makes it easier to transfer, okay? 
Uh, you don't want to put in a whole lot, but you do want it to dissolve. Um, then, you'll take your 250 ml volumetric flask, okay? Um, these are class B glassware. See if you can zoom in on this and see what it says right on the jar. Okay, so it says 250 class B. And it tells us plus or minus a, a tolerance down here and a temperature. It says to, to contain, TC. This means that if I have used this device correctly, it will always measure plus or minus to the second decimal place which means this one has a lot of significant figures, right? So if we're dissolving our oxalic acid in a volumetric flask to a volume of 250 milliliters with two decimal places, this is what that volume looks like, right? So we have five significant figures. Um, so this is not gonna limit our precision either, right? The scale will have four sig figs from four decimal places. This will have five, okay? Every piece of volumetric glassware, that is anything that says class B on it, always has two decimal places. So we're going to use a few different things today that, that have that level of precision. Your volumetric flask is one of them. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to have your oxalic acid dissolved in just a small volume of water. I would say less than 100 milliliters if you can do it. And so you just swirl until it dissolves. And then you're going to pour it into here. Then take your deionized water and rinse this flask into here at least two or three times. Again, remember from our transfer loss experiment that at least two or three rinses is required to remove the material from a transfer, okay? So we wanna make sure that all the oxalic acid we put in dissolves in here and then we pour it in here. The reason we don't just take the oxalic acid and try to force it into here is because about 50% of the time, when we have a solid and we're trying to fit it into a volumetric flask, it's gonna go all over the table. And then you have to clean everything up and start it over again. Um, we need that mass to be really specific. So by dissolving it in a small amount of water and then transferring it quantitatively, which means rinsing with water a few times, okay? And dumping it into our container that we're transferring to. We're trying to ensure that all of the oxalic acid ends up in there. Now at that point, once you've dissolved the acid, it is no longer oxalic acid dihydrate, find my sign here, okay. It's not a dihydrate anymore. Once you have surrounded the oxalic acid with water, this drifts away into the solvent, just becomes part of the solvent. So now, um, the reacting species is just this part, the actual acid, okay? And that's important when you're trying to write your reactions down. All right, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna simulate this with a colored dye, so you can kind of see a little bit better, all right? You don't need to use a funnel that's just going to cause more transfer loss, all right? We want to minimize the amount of stuff that, that sort of touches our oxalic acid. Um, so all you do is put the two containers together like so and pour slowly and it'll be fine. Now yours is not going to be blue. Again, I dyed this just so that you could, you could visualize what's happening better. Yours won't be as bubbly either. The dye does that, okay? So what you're going to do is fill it up till about the neck, all right? And um, you don't really want to go too much past that simply because it fills up really fast, okay? And each flask has a different marking point. They're each calibrated individually by hand. Okay, so we fill it up too close to the neck. I don't want to go too much above that because it fills really quickly. This particular flask has an etched circle right here. So that's ultimately where I'm trying to get my line. And what I want is to have the meniscus just like this, all right? So our etched line, if we're looking at it on the eye level, is gonna be a line instead of a circle. So that's one clue. And then what I want is the bottom of the meniscus, your meniscus will be symmetric, right? Mine's not, but it will be when you do it for real. The bottom of the meniscus is going to touch that line just perfectly. So to achieve that, what we do is we are going to use pipettes. And so I choose a Pasteur pipette. You could use a medicine dropper from your drawer. It doesn't really matter. This gets a bit of a bigger volume. This is my stock bottle. We never put anything into the stock bottle, spatulas or pipettes or anything like that. So I have a little beaker from the drawer here. I'm just going to pour out a little bit so that I can pipette. Okay. So you're just gonna add it 
I think I'm gonna put a little more in. Ideally, I don't want to have these little drops all over the place, okay? It takes a little practice to get that down. But you can also sort of do this trick where you turn it from the neck and sometimes those drops will come down, okay? We want to try to get everything below the line before we fill it to the line, because otherwise we have an additional amount of liquid that's not accounted for. So, I have a bubble, I'm just gonna pop it. So what I'm gonna do is just take some pipette, and I wanna get down on the eye level so that that etched mark no longer looks like a circle. And you just keep adding, okay? I'll show you what this looks like with a background in a second. Okay, and so once you get close like this, you wanna add what they call drop-wise, which means one drop at a time. Hmm, not quite there. I think I'm going to do like two more drops. Okay. So, one thing that can help visualize these things is to make yourself a little paper square. And sometimes it's better to have a white background, sometimes it's better to have a black background. So all I did was take a Sharpie and make a little card for myself. And I used to leave these in my drawer just to have them handy. So for this one, the white background is better. So zoom in on this and just look at what the meniscus is supposed to be. There's an etched line there, and the meniscus is just barely touching it on the bottom. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. Then, oh, I forgot my cap. Hang on. So on each one of these flasks, well not everyone, but most of them tell you what size cap. This one says cap number five, so I'm going to choose cap number five. These are how they work. They're kind of funky. Um, you don't just push flat down like that. you got to start on one edge, and then you kind of use your thumbs to like lean over like this. I'm just kind of pushing with my thumbs from one side to the other. And then it'll snap on. Now, you're going to be dissolving something. You're going to be diluting your already dissolved oxalic acid. So you have to invert it like this 10 to 20 times to ensure that you have a homogeneous solution. It's not going to mix very well, especially in this region, um, because of the simple fact that, that it's very narrow. Okay. So to help it mix completely, you want to make sure to invert thoroughly. Uh, if you don't, then what's going to happen is the, the concentration of your acid at the top is lower than it is at the bottom, and so your titrations in the beginning are going to require a lot less base, and then you're not going to be able to get consistency, which means you're going to have to take more measurements. So taking an extra two minutes to, um, to, to, to mix this properly is really beneficial for you. Okay, so this is your standard solution. You know the concept, well, you can calculate the concentration to about four significant digits because the mass of the oxalic was obtained with four decimal places. All right, and so that's that's part one, okay? Um, in part two, we already produced the, the 0.1 molar NaOH, so it used to be that we would make this in lab ourselves, but we found that people don't have time to do that, unfortunately, because it's a very helpful exercise. So our technician has made this for you already. So if you have a version of the procedure that still has part two preparation of sodium hydroxide solution, you can disregard that. It's already prepared for you. Again, these are stock bottles, though. Don't put anything into them because then everybody coming after you has a contaminated sample. Okay? So then part three is where we are going to standardize our sodium hydroxide. In other words, we only know this concentration to one sig fig, 0.1. We need to know it to four or more in order to be a standardized solution. So the first thing we have to do is prepare a burette. So the burettes are located on the side bench near where you usually pick up your chemicals. Okay? And they're stored like this. They're stored upside down with the stopcock open. And that's because that when you finish, you want to you want to clean it and then leave it to dry thoroughly. If this is closed, it doesn't dry very well. Okay. Um, you really only need one of them. They all come with two at a time. So if, if you're in a full lab, then what we can do is turn it sideways and you can share across the table from each other. 
If you don't have a full lab, I recommend getting your own and not sharing. It's a lot easier than reaching across the table. Okay. This is called a burette clamp. They're specially designed to hold a burette completely vertical. Um, you operate them by pinching the clamp here to let the burette go. Now, burettes aren't super cheap, so make sure you're gentle with this. Don't use it for sword fighting or whacking the table. I know it's tempting. Try to avoid it. Okay, so in the procedure, it tells you first to wash with a mild soap solution. That's this thing, okay? And so when you're cleaning a burette, you're going to do it in the sink. Our sinks are especially deep with really high faucets so that you can do this, all right? So you're just going to kind of hold it in the sink, and you can pump a few squirts of soap in there. Close this part, this, this valve, and you can kind of, you know, shake it to get it clean, okay? That's step one. The next thing you're going to do is then rinse it with some distilled water. So you're gonna use your squirt bottle to do that. Making sure in all, all of your rinses that you do open the valve and allow the liquid to, to rinse the valve and the end of your burette. So you're gonna do a couple rinses with distilled water to get the soap out. And then your final rinse is always going to be with the material that you're using. So today, um, we're gonna to be putting our base inside of our burette. So we're gonna use this. I, again, I like to use a secondary container to make sure that I'm not pipetting or putting anything in the stock bottle. So there's a little dye in here which will make it easier for you to see the markings. Um, yours won't be like that, all right? So a burette holds 50 milliliters, 50.00 milliliters, because it is also a class B um, glassware, all right? So all of that information is right at the top. It tells you the tolerance, tells you the temperature that it was calibrated at, all kinds of info right on here. But this holds 50 milliliters. So I filled up uh, my 100 mil a little bit, and what I wanna do is put the end in the sink, all right? We can put acids and bases in the sink because we have neutralizers. Normally we wouldn't do that, but our sinks are especially equipped, so it's okay. So we're gonna put this in the sink with the valve open. You can tell it's open when it's pointing towards the the direction of the glass. The cross is closed, pointing towards the, sort of in this parallel direction is open. So I'm gonna put that end in the sink, okay? And then I'm gonna use a funnel. These are in your drawer, but uh, sometimes the ones in the drawer are the, the larger stemmed funnel, which is handy for filtering. But here, they're not gonna fit well inside of your burette. So what you can do is on the side bench in our labs, we have a drawer that's marked funnel, and you can go look for one with a thinner stem. That will sit right in there, okay? And so basically, what you're gonna do is take your sodium hydroxide, the 0.1 molar that's already prepared for you, and you're just gonna pour it in and rinse, all right? You don't have to fill the entire burette to rinse. I let a little bit drain out, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is take my funnel out, and you can turn it and sort of let it leak up. You can even put this end into the sink and turn it and let it drain out that way, okay? So what I don't want to see is the burette on the stand and you trying to fill it above your head. That's not safe because then the chemicals are above your head, you don't have as much control and they're likely to come down on your face. <laughs> and a uh, base on your face is bad. I feel like you could write a YouTube song. Um, anyway, so you're going you're gonna to drain this, you're going to rinse it with your deionized wa uh, water several times. Then you're going to do the same thing with your NaOH solution. The reason for that is just to ensure that the, there's no cross-contamination, there's no traces of soap or water left in your burette or whatever was used before you. All right. And so once that's done, you're going to fill it completely. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. doesn't have to go to the zero mark exactly because you're going to record <clears throat> an initial and a final measurement for every titration that you do. No way you guys aren't going to believe this. It's perfect. The odds of that are astronomical. That was just luck. It's not skill. Although titration is a skill that you get better at with practice. Okay, so when I put the burette in here, I'm going to make sure that the clamp is putting it completely vertically, okay? Um, I don't want it tilted one way or the other because that's gonna affect where the bubble is. 
I take out my funnel, because if you look at this closely, when I did that, some more stuff dripped down. So it was the perfect volume, but if we can zoom in a little bit, we'll see that it is not at zero anymore. Let me turn it around so you guys can read it. All right, so our zero mark is right there. And I think the white might be the best way to view this, okay? So it's a little bit above zero at this point, but that's okay because we can just drain it out. And I'm not ready to titrate yet anyway because if we look down here, we can see that there is a gigantic air bubble stuck in here. So what we do is we're gonna use our, a larger beaker for a waste. This way, if anything drips or if I overfill or you know anything goes wrong, then there's something to catch the mess. All right, so this is gonna be my waste beaker. And so all I'm gonna do is not really pay attention to the volume at this point. This one's crooked. I'm gonna open the valve so that the fluid passes through and I'm gonna to try to get this bubble out. It can be tricky. All right, so you zoomed in on this. All right, so some of the bubble came out, but you'll notice there's still some right up top right here. Maybe you can see it better like this. So there's a bubble stuck in there and I wanna get it out. Some tricks, you can just let it flow for a few minutes. In this case, that worked. Okay, just a couple seconds really, not even minutes. Sometimes the bubbles will be stubborn and you might need to adjust the pressure here. Seek help from your instructor in that case. You don't want it to be too loose because it'll leak out. You don't want it to be too tight because it's hard to turn. Um, and if it's too loose, air bubbles will come in from the side and sort of accumulate right there anyways. All right. If you still have really stubborn bubbles and adjusting the valve doesn't work, you can also do um, a couple tricks. All right. Maybe that was a little snug, so I'm going to loosen it. Um, you can get the, the valve so it's almost vertical and then really quickly turn it. That wasn't really quick. Really quickly turn it to let a tiny bit out and that can kind of force the bubble to go. Or you can open it wide and tap it, okay? It can take some finesse. It can take a little bit of patience to get all the bubbles out, but it's really important that you do because if there is a bubble trap in the end here where we can't measure, it's going to fluctuate in size, okay? So gases expand and contract depending on the, the pressure and the temperature, etc. So we wanna make sure that there's no bubbles in here to do that. Now, um, I have a volume up here that is not zero anymore because of course I drained some of it out and that's okay, that's not a big deal, all right? So I'm gonna read this and then what I want you to do is see if you get the same measurement, okay? So I like to use my little paper so that it's easier to see. And I have to remember that this records to two decimal places. It's also kind of backwards, so zero is up here. And as we go down, we're, we're sort of measuring how much liquid has been added. So here, my initial reading is going to end up being about 4.6, no, call it 4.78. Okay, so I'm going to turn it around, get a good shot of it for you, and see if you agree. Remember, of course, that the zero is up there. So that's how your works. So you're gonna write down your initial volume and then you're going to get your acid sample ready. All right, so in this case, we'll have our volumetric flask with our oxalic acid. Again, yours is not blue, okay? I just used this as an example so you can see it better. This is our standard. We're gonna use 20 milliliters, 20.00 milliliters of oxalic acid. So that means we're using a class B volumetric pipette, okay? And so that means this is, it says 20, but that really means 20.00 because, you know, it's volumetric. So there's two different kinds of bulbs, and which one you choose to use is going to depend on your personal preference. All right. These ones have ball valves, um, so it's, if you have relatively strong hands, most people uh, that fall into that category prefer these ones. They're easier to manipulate in terms of dexterity. These ones don't require as much strength, but they do require a little bit more finesse, all right? So it kind of depends. Try them both, see which one you like, all right? 
I can pipette out of this, although sometimes it can draw a vacuum if the flask is smaller, so sometimes I choose not to. I'll just pour it into another container then. This pipette is much thinner than the neck here, so it should be okay. Um, I'll show you how to use both bulbs. So first, the, the finesse weapon <laughs> over here. You're gonna submerge it in here, make sure you don't overflow. Make sure you also don't put the pipette straight against the bottom because it won't suck anything up then. I am right-handed, so if you're left-handed, you're gonna reverse this. My off hand goes up top with my thumb up, and my um, dominant hand is gonna hold the bulb. So first, squeeze out the air. When you do this, if you see liquid come out, you need a different bulb. It's not gonna work very well. It also means that someone sucked a bunch of liquid through, and you shouldn't let the liquid get that high. Our marking on this one is down here. All right, so what we're gonna do, submerge it. Gently place the aspirator on top here. You're not jamming it down. It doesn't stay on permanently. You're just holding it, all right? And this will suck up the fluid for you. For you. you have to kind of keep an eye on the fluid level in the flask so you don't suck up air, because that can mess it up. So you can control the amount of uh, the speed, really, by, by sort of pressing the bowl. Right now I'm pushing it a little bit. Now I'm letting it go a little bit. And what I'm looking for is I want the blue just above this brown line here. Uh, well, it's a circle, really. So, but you want to bend down so it looks like a line. And then you release the volume until it gets to the, the solid line here. You want, again, you want your meniscus to touch it just perfectly. Then you remove your hand and you just let it drain into the flask that you're going to use for your measurements. So Erlenmeyer flasks are ideal for this because they prevent splashing from being too bad. Everything kind of drains back down to the bottom. So I'm going to let the pipette drain. And once it's finished, there's going to be a teeny bit of liquid stuck at the tip that's supposed to be there. Don't blow it out, okay? Leave it there. Um, the, the glassware is calibrated to contain, well, this is to contain exactly 250.00 milliliters if you fill it to the line. This is TD to deliver, all right? And it's Okay, so the other kind of bowl does attach to this um, you kind of just wiggle it on there. And then within each one of these little spaces that have a button is a little metal bearing. And all you gotta do is squeeze it so that it will open around the bearing, okay? Same thing here, I'm not pushing it all the way against the bottom. The first thing to do is it's gonna come to you with the bulb inflated. So you squeeze A, which stands for aspirate. This is the A button up here. So you squeeze A and then squeeze the bulb to eject the air. And then I'm going to push S, which I think stands for suck. I don't know what else they would call it. And that's going to suck up the liquid for you. This one's a little easier to control, but again, you've got to have pretty strong hands. I don't, so it's a little tough for me, but it, you know, it's not too bad. So you're going to go above the brown line again, and then drip out until the meniscus barely touches. So to get it out, you expel. That's E. So it goes... A to, to get the air out, S to suck, E to expel, okay? So I level again, and I'm gonna get rid of the extra. And if I go a little too far, it's okay. I'll just go back in and try again. Okay. And then of course, that's gonna go into your flask, like that, okay? Don't get any water in this, so otherwise it doesn't work all that well, okay? That's it. Celebrated to include leaving this little bit there. Okay, so don't squirt it out. So we've delivered our 20 milliliters of acid. When we do our calculations, it's gonna be based on 20 milliliters of acid, not based on the entire 250 milliliters. We're not using all of this for each titration, so make sure you understand that. Okay, so we got our, we got our uh, 20 mils of acid in here. Then we're gonna add two to three drops of phenol phthalein. Okay, that's this stuff. I'm gonna say that one more time so you can practice it before we get to lab. It's a tough one but phenol phthalein. And so phenol phthalein is interesting. It's an indicator that is clear in acidic solution. So when you first put it in here, it's not, not gonna look like anything. It's just clear, colorless liquid. Um, but as we add base to it, it will uh, eventually turn pink, okay? Uh, so what we're gonna do is take this solution and you've already recorded your initial volume or if you haven't, you should do that now. And you want to get this little droppy off there, okay? And you're going to put 
your acid and phenolphthalein solution right in there, um, and you just titrate it, which means you're going to add some base relatively slowly. I find the best method is to use my dominant hand to control the valve, and I use my off hand to kind of swirl this. Okay? So you're just going to do this. You're going to keep adding, keep adding, keep adding. Um, so when you first add your base to your acid, you're not going to see anything. So if we can zoom in close and look at this. I mix it as I'm adding. You're going to have to play around a little bit with where your hands are and which hands do what, okay? Um, but as you start, you're not going to see anything. It seems like nothing is happening. I caution you to be patient, okay? The first time you do the titration, it can be kind of rough, so I'm going pretty quickly at this point. And what I'm looking for is where pink clouds start to form. Once I see that, I slow down, okay? So we started this experiment at a volume of about 3.68 milliliters, and I've added quite a lot, okay? You can see the volume of my liquid is here now. I'm close to the 50 milliliter mark. I don't want to go past this mark because if I let it drain past that, I can't measure it. And that means I don't know what the volume is, okay? So when you get close to 50, if, if you have this situation happen, this is one of the unknowns. They are each a different concentration. And it just happens this one needs a lot of base. So I'm gonna remove my sample and I'm gonna take this out and I'm gonna refill it using the same technique we already showed you um, with my base. Oh, the part I forgot, you should not do this, is I didn't tell you that I wrote down the measurement of where I was at, all right? So if you write down your measurement before you fill and your new initial afterwards, then you can add the volumes together. Don't forget to do that. It may not be an issue for some of you because you might not need 50 milliliters or more, but if you do, stop before you get to the 50, write that volume down as part of the same run, and then you're going to write your, new, your second initial volume so that you can add the total together. Another note of caution, um, remember that the funnel occupies some space in here, so don't fill it too close to the top. If you do go past the 50 mark, you have to dump that experiment and do another one. Um, remember to check for bubbles again, because once, you once you've drained this out, it can get bubbly. Okay, so then we're going to we're going to record our new start volume. In this case, I happen to fill it up right to about 2.49 milliliters. So if you want to take a look here, I think this is 2.49. Now, if you thought it was 2.50, that's possible. The camera is currently at a lower angle. And you'll notice every time I read my volumes, I'm trying to get up eye level with it. Uh, we do have stools in the lab. It's a lot easier than tiptoes, also more accurate. Okay, but remember you got to be eye level. If I'm looking at it from below, my volumes are going to be higher than I think they are. Okay, so back to titrating. Um, I actually do it backwards. It's kind of strange, but I do. And so we just keep adding and adding and adding. We're seeing a little bit of blue tint. That's from my dye that I had in there earlier. Oh, so zoom in on this. Can you see the pink cloud that just forms? Watch when I put the base in. And then when it mixes, it goes away. See it? That's a hint that I'm close. So this is the, the stage where I kind of slow down a little bit. I'm not going to just let it pour in anymore. You can actually go a drop at a time, like this, if you control your valve carefully. Okay? Um, so it's going to persist a little bit and then disappear for quite a while, depending on the concentration of the acid. So I'm going dropwise at this point, just you know, little drops, and you can see that the pink cloud is there. The burette stands are white for a reason. It's easier to see this on a white surface than it is a darker surface. If you happen to cross a burette stand that's not white, just fold a piece of paper and put it underneath there. Okay, so you can start to see this cloud a little better. This is what I'm talking about. This is not done yet, okay? Because if I mix this, it goes away. We want the lightest pink that you can imagine to persist for at least 30 seconds. That's our, that's our end point. Okay, so you just keep going. 
This is where you want to exercise your patience a little bit, okay? Because if you go too fast, you're going to have to redo it more times. Keep it mixing also. So you'll notice that the pink cloud is persisting longer and longer as we go along. That means it's getting closer and closer to the end point. So again, just to remind you, the end point is when the acid and base, blue. Um, the H plus and the OH minus so are exactly there. It was just one or two drops. drops. And so I'm trying to get to that right. exact point. So this is a pale, pale pink. This is an ideal um, end point here, right? Um, I want to show you this compared to where we started, colorless. So this is acidic. This is neutralized, okay? And then here is way too pink. And it can even get pinker than this. You don't want this. This is too far, okay? You can see this pink is starting to go away already. That might not be quite the equivalence point, but if it persists for 30 seconds, then it is. So I would record my final volume here with two decimal places, all volumes on the burette, two decimal places every time. And I would also make an observation about what this looks like. Does it look more like our fuchsia color here, or does it look more like our very, very pale pink here? Okay. Um, so that's your data for this experiment, combination of volumes and observations. In this particular experiment, I'm going to have to add together the two different burette ones that I did to get the total amount of NaOH that I put in. All right, so that's an important thing to note. So you're going to keep doing this with your NaOH and your oxalic acid until you have um, three results within 0.5 milliliters of each other, okay? Um, if it takes you more than like four, five maybe titrations, you should talk to your professor. Uh, maybe even more than four, I would say. Because it means there's something in the technique that's not working out and you need to diagnose the issue before you spend the whole lab period doing that, okay? Because the next part is to determine the concentration of an unknown acid. So what you need to do when you get to this, so I'm in uh, part five now, is write down the unknown number and write down the identity. So we know what acid this is. We don't know the concentration of it. So that's what you're trying to calculate. You do need to know what the acid is to write the reaction. Okay, some of them are one to one, some of them are two to one. So you gotta write that down, don't forget it. Um, but you're still gonna have the NaOH in your burette. So that part's not different. You're gonna put your, oh no, I got acid on my face. <laughs> I'll wash that. You're going to put your acid into your flask and do the same exact process that I just showed you. Um, the only thing that's different is instead of using 20 milliliters of this, you're going to use 10. So you're going to use a smaller pipette. Be sure to pour this into a beaker and pipette out of that, not out of the, the container here. So for wastes today, it's super easy. Acids and bases just go in the sink. They're not hazardous uh, once they're neutralized. And so all your containers just go in the sink.